So, since you're a Bible-believing bunch, yeah? Yeah. I want you to uh, consider something. How much do you trust the Bible? How much do you trust the Bible? Okay, can I just quickly see some hands? I just want, to, I just want everyone else to kind of know. Okay, I've prayed for a couple of people. How many of you either have been completely healed or have had a dramatic improvement in your symptoms? Can you please put up your hands for me? Put up your hands up, up. Okay, good. So that, it's already God work. Amen? Now, what He does through me, He'll do through you. Same spirit, same power. The only difference is how you think versus how I think, and my experience versus your experience. That's it. Okay? Do you know God gave us all legs? Yeah. But we all get to use them the way we decide to use them, isn't it? <laughs> some people can run really fast, faster than us, isn't that right? That's true, yeah. The same legs. The autonomy is exactly the same. Yeah. But they develop their muscles differently to you because they decide to train themselves in a way that you don't. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. So, what might be the difference between you and someone else? Like, have you heard this thing that, you know, they say that men and women have different brains? Have you heard that? Yes. Okay, they don't have different brains. If you go look at it, it's the same thing. It's a big blob of fat. It's the same thing. Do you know the brain is like a muscle? Okay? The more you work it, the stronger it gets. Do you know that? Do you know that the minute you decide you can't do something, your brain will not allow you to try and do it? Sure. So when you're young, like before you're eight, someone says to you, you suck at maths and you'll never be good at it. And you believe them, you'll always suck at maths and you'll never be good at it. That's true. Yeah. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with your brain. Yeah. Your brain can be marvelous at maths, but you've chosen to believe it. You can't be. And you have a mental block. Does this make sense? Yeah. You see, we choose what we can and can't do Based on what we believe we can and can't do. Yeah. And we, we believe that based on what we believe we are. Yes. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So in order to change what we can and can't do, we actually have to change what we believe we are. That's true. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, now, I'll tell you this cool little story that I made up. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pretty good storyteller. But it's got a point to it, okay? So my stories always have lessons. My children have learned that, okay? And you'll be partaking in my marvelous storytelling techniques. <laughs> They're still a bit under advisory, but, you know, give me some grace. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. yes. I want you to imagine that um, a boy or a king had two kids, mm -hmm. and they were twins, all right? Now, this is quite a famous story. You've probably heard this before. And one day, the kids, they were both five years old. They were twins. They were playing outside the palace, and there's a river that flows down from the palace. And um, one of the kids were playing hide and seek with the other. And while the one was hiding, the other one ended up falling in the river. Knocked his head and fell in the river. And the river carried him downstream. And when he found himself, he was in a small village, ways down the stream. And the village um, people, they didn't know what the 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 baby prince looked like because they'd never seen the baby prince. Mm -hmm. You only really see the prince when he gets older, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't know this was the prince. They didn't know this was the prince of the king, right? They thought this was just another kid, a random kid, and they did the right thing, and they brought the kid into the village, and they basically, he didn't have any parents, right? And so he was brought up very much to be the village idiot. Oh, we need someone to clean the barns. Call Tom. Right? But one day when the king's son, um, his other son, right? He, the brother of the son that's now the village idiot. You following me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. When his son was 15 years old, 
the king decided to introduce his son to all the kingdom. So, obviously, he had mourned the death of his other son and was starting on his journey. Anyway, he eventually comes along to this village. And while he's in the village, showing off his son, the villagers say, but your son looks very much like this other guy we know called Tom. Sure. Right? And the king's like, what do you mean? When did Tom arrive? Well, we found Tom in the river. Tom was only a child of five years old, but he didn't remember who he was, and so we've kind of been looking after him here. And so the king finds his long-lost twin son. Amen? Amen. And the twin son, he has no recollection of being anything like a prince, does he? What do you think he might be used to? Cleaning barns, sleeping outside, living off scraps, getting the bare minimum he can. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's what he's used to. And so, even though he was born a king, He's lived like a slave. Wow. So you mean you can be a king and live like a slave? Only if you forget who you are. Yeah. You see, when the king comes to that son and says, I'm your father, do you think that son goes, oh, wow, there you've been all this time. I knew I'm a prince. I knew I was a prince all this time. Do you think that's what happened? Or does he go, well, where have you been for 15 years? <laughs> and when he gets shipped off to the palace, do you think he knows what it means to, you know, understand the hierarchy within the palace? Do you think he understands what his brother has learned in the last 10 years that he never had the privilege of learning? Do you think he's going to just cotton on to this thing? You see, he was born a king, but he wasn't raised a king. <clears throat> yeah. I promise you I'm making a very strong point, and I think you might be hearing me. Yeah. You see, the problem we have right now in the body of Christ is that we've got a bunch of kings who've never been trained to be kings. Amen. Amen. And many of them have forgotten who they really are. And what they've done is they've settled for the village idiot. Rather than realizing they're sons of the king. And ladies, listen, let me tell you this for real. I'm a pretty bride, so you can be a good son. Amen? Amen. So here's the real deal, guys. We need to learn this thing. The only way you're going to actually live like a king is if you learn what it's like to be a king. Cool thing, we had a big brother Jesus showed us how to do it. Exactly. Yay. <laughs> got a, we got a visual example. We got one that the Bible says walked so closely to the example that he was meant to portray that you would mistake where God started and Jesus ended and where Jesus ended and the Father started. Because they were one. I want you to please go with me in your Bible if you can. Because before people say, I don't use my Bible to teach. <laughs> I think I've used lots of Bible. <laughs> go with me to John uh, 14. Because I really want to, I want to hit this thing home. Okay? Much of what we're going to talk about, okay, I talk mainly, mainly, my main drive, no matter what it is. Power is a product of who you are. You can write it down. Power is a product of who you are. Power is a product of who you are. Okay? Power independent of the character and nature of God is the possibility of being corrupted. Okay? So there are many people out there who operate in spiritual power, but you can't always be sure necessarily where they're getting their power from. Okay, it's the first thing. Now, let's say they're all legitimate, which is cool. I'm good with that, okay? Just because they have power doesn't mean they're right. Amen. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay, because there are two extremes in the body of Christ. One, knowledge. Other, power. 
What did Jesus say to the Sadducees? And if, if you don't like this joke, that's fine. But those of you who like it, you'll laugh. They were Sadducees. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the Sadducees, they didn't know something. They didn't know the Word of God, and they didn't know the power of God. So because they didn't know either of these, or both of these, Jesus didn't take them seriously. Isn't that right? So you need to know the Word of God, and you need to know the power of God. Okay? But you know what? I've learned that that is not enough. You might say, what do you mean that is not enough? You need to know who you are. Otherwise, power is just a, a means to an end. And that end, okay, is your selfish gain. Not the advancement of the kingdom. Does that make sense? Okay? Now, does God want us well? Amen. He does. Does God, does God want us blessed? Oh, yes, He does. But does God want that at the expense of you growing up? No. Which is why it's set up in such a way that only by trusting His Word through any situation will you actually walk in what He has for you. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, how many of you liked cookies when you were growing up? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you know even your web browser like cookies? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd laugh about that one. Okay, so you like cookies? Everyone likes cookies. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Um, did you notice when you were younger, it was a lot more difficult to get a hold of them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay, so where did your mother put the cookies? In the cookie jar on the fridge. Yeah? Out of what they call reach. Out of reach. Out of reach. But you notice when you got older, Okay, two things changed. One, self control in increased, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that was because the last time you got in the cookie jar, you remembered something horrible happened. <laughs> you don't remember exactly what that was, but you know it wasn't all that good, so you were a lot more reserved now with the cookie jar. <laughs> so you know, the parents that, that deal with their children well, they, they know exactly what you're talking about. Isn't that right? So you learned something, right? You learned some self control, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And you know that as you grew up, you gained height, you gained self-control, and guess what? The cookie jar became reachable. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And this is a very valuable lesson to be learned from the cookie jar. And that is that much of what God has already given us in the kingdom is only accessible when it's reachable. What makes it reachable is your journey. To what degree has love been perfected in you? Because true spiritual maturity is not governed by knowledge and it's not governed by power, but it's governed by to which degree the love of God has been manifested in your life. How many of you have ever read, read that cool passage in Galatians 6 where it says, If anyone is caught in sin, let those of you who are spiritual go and restore such a one in the yeah, spirit yeah, yeah, of meekness. Yeah. Have you ever read that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so nice to read it, isn't it? Only they did it. It would be great. But <laughs> the reality is that doesn't happen. Okay? Now, the reason it doesn't happen is because often those who think they are spiritual are not. Yeah. Yes. Because in Galatians 6, when it says that those of you who are spiritual go, it's talking about someone who is spiritual. Now, what is the, the, what is the classification of spiritual? Well, spiritual are those who have had love perfected in them. Which means they have no hidden agenda. They're not coming to restore you in order to try and manipulate you. Their sole intention is for your good and not for their own. They're not going to try and keep a record of the things you've done a hundred years ago. To try and keep it over your head so they can control you. Why? Because love is governing them, and love, does, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Are you with me? Yes. They're going to be kind, and they're going to be patient, because that's how love is. Yes. Okay? This is the true me measure of spirituality. Why? Because God is a spirit. Say it with me. God is a spirit, and so am I. And so am I. All right. So if God is a spirit, is God love? Yes. Is he love? Yes. Well, John 4, 1 John 4 says, Whoever abides in God, right, abides in love. 
and God abides in him and he abides in them. Yeah. So then later on in that same chapter, it says, as he is, many of you like to quote this one, by the way, it's in the context of God being love. Yes, amen. Right. As he is love, so are you love. Amen. Is that right? Yes. As he is, and it's, it's talking in the context of him being love. Yep. Even so are you in this world, talking about you being love in this context. Amen. Amen. Bam. Well, then you go back and you realize that if God is a spirit and he is love, and love looks like 1 Corinthians 13, right from what? Verse 4 to like 6, yeah? Are you with me? So I am quoting scripture again. Don't worry, we're going to get to John, I promise you. <laughs> okay? Are you guys enjoying this? Okay, so, so, so if we say, okay, God is a spirit and he is love, then guess what? The spirit of God is love. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because one and one equals two, people. That's yeah. right, good, okay? So if God is a spirit and he is love, then love is the gauge by which we measure spirituality. Isn't that right? Yes. Because you see, my brothers and sisters, the Corinthian church was out the world, and yet they were advancing in the gifts yes. of power yes. more than anyone else in the church. So just because you're kicking up some spiritual power doesn't mean that you're mature. So when you stop gauging maturity by power and start gauging it, by the love of God. Amen. This is what's going to change the church. I promise you now. Because Okay, check Ephesians 4 out, right? It says all this stuff about the, the gifts being given so that we all may be equipped for the works of, the, of, of uh, service, right? Each one of us can do these different things. And at the end it says so we all may be built up in what? Love. 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 You know what Paul writes? He says in Timothy, I think it's 1 Timothy, he says the goal of everything we teach now, hold on. He's about to give you, like, the reason we do all this stuff. Isn't that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The goal of everything we teach is love. It comes from a pure heart, a clean conscience, and a sincere faith. Amen. Whoa! Yes. Hallelujah! You, you go down 1 Corinthians 13, right? And what do you see? He says, at the end, only these three remain. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. What's the greatest? Love. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Why? Because God is love. Yes. And listen, I'm not talking about this erotic nonsense that's out there in the world. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is not the love I'm talking about. You know, people tell me, you know what, you know, Mark, you've got to understand the Greeks, you know, they broke love down into all these different versions of love. I'm like, you know what, Jesus wasn't Greek. But, no, and God is not Greek. God is God. When he says love, he means love. Yeah. That's why John had to say, this is how we know love. How? That God sent his only son to die for us. For no greater love has a man for his friend and to lay down his life for him. This is how Jesus demonstrated the love of God. He served us to the very end. Amen? Yes. Okay. So I'm getting to John 14. All good? All right. right. Now, how many of you enjoyed what I just said? Okay. Now, do you feel right now, as I just said what I said, that you feel like you're positioned in a better place than you were when you came in here? Mm -hmm. yes. Anybody? Yeah, yeah. You're positioned in your mind in a better place than you were when you came in here. Yeah. Now, I know some of you personally, I know you've got really good at like... Um, knowledge on character and everything. So I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to everybody else that I don't know. <laughs> so, but if you feel like you're in a better place right now, something happened to you. Something just happened to you. The reason why the Word of God comes out is because God has got your best interests at heart. Okay, now, um, how many of you have got kids? <clears throat> Oh, well done. I'm proud of you. Every one of you. Every one of you. Um, if you look under your seat, you get to be like Jesus. Hey, let have fun. Come on, man. You know, Jesus, I'm sure he smiled sometimes. <laughs> okay, so, so what, what I want you to do, something really radical happened to you tonight, and it's going to keep happening. 
but, but it's something you never expected was going to happen. Because when I mention this thing, you're going to go, no way. Okay? So I'm going to kind of keep you, you know, um, in the dark. So if you've got your Bible open, John 14 is here. John 15 is there. Just jump over, right? Just go to John 15. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. John 15, I want to read from verse 1. Just check this out. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, why does someone say I'm the true vine? Because there is a fake one. Yes, of course. Hello. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. So I am the true vine. Yeah? This is what Jesus says, right? And my father is the gardener or the vine dresser. How many of you are know which way? Look, the one way, at least it's going to be good for you, right? Now, when I, when I used to understand this concept, what do you think the word prune means in this sentence? What does it mean, the word prune? I need water. Just think about that. Mm-hmm. Cutting out the bed. If you've done any kind of gardening, you'll know it means to clean. Right? The word prune means to clean. Yeah? Because when you clean the dead things out, you leave more resources for the healthy things so that you can allow the healthy things to grow better. Okay? So the word prune means clean. Right? Now, how does God prune us? Some people will say, well... You know when those bad things happen, Mark? You know, that's when, that's when God's pruning us. You know, testing our character, testing who we are, trying to see whether we're going to stand the test of time. You know, because God's got a plethora of these knowledge of good and evil trees that He just plants everywhere to get everyone <laughs> tested. Because, you know, we don't want any fakes in heaven. We want to make sure you got tested. Are you are you are you the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, positive or negative? We we need to make sure. Yeah, I know I'm speaking cryptic, but you got it right. Okay, what I'm saying to you is it's very clear. Okay, we think that trials and circumstances come to prune us. Okay, you know I used to think that. I used to believe that until I read the next sentence. It took me a while though. <laughs> just read on. It, took, it took me a while. But, but watch this. Because, because one day I'm reading it and I'm going, God, you know, it's just not fair. He says, just read the next sentence. And I'm like, okay, right, well, I'll read the next sentence. Well, it says, already. Say with me. I am already. Pruned. Yeah, because of the word of God. So what he says here, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Guess what? You got just, you just, all of you, you just got pruned tonight. All of you. Yeah. Okay? Which means we got rid of some dead stuff. Isn't that right? Right? Some belief systems that maybe were just not in line with God's truth. Right? And guess who did the work? Jesus, right? The Father pruned the garden. How did he do it? With the word. Yes. Isn't that right? Yeah. Because... Because of the word I have spoken to you, you have already been cleaned. Yeah, awesome. Now people can say, but Mark, you're not Jesus. And I can say to you, what do you mean? Because how does he live here and not speak through me? How do I represent him and he doesn't talk through me? How do I say what he says and him not say it again? I mean, how are you ever going to accept that you are like Jesus unless you believe you can actually be like Jesus? Okay, watch, I'm going to prove my point. John 14. See, I told you I'll get there. John 14. Verse 1. Uh, no, 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 we're not going to go verse 1. Hold on. Um, okay, verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Yeah? No one comes to the Father except through me. You know that this is the number one thing that no other religious symbol has ever said. I mean, Confucius was too confused to say it. <laughs> Buddha was too asleep to think about it. Right? Um, the lady with the eight arms, she just, she's 
distracted counting her fingers. And so, there's many things like that, you know, when you've got a trunk, it's kind of difficult to find the end of it. And stuff like that, it's very difficult, you know. None of them ever said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And by the way, just so you know, um, you know, Allah is actually called Baal in the Old Testament. Okay? All right? Baalah. Okay? All right? He's called Baal. Baalah. You know what happened when the ark was in the same place as the statue of Baal? Boom! Yeah. Right, okay, so that's what God thinks of him. Hallelujah. Right, so now we all understand, okay? <clears throat> Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay? No one else has ever said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, except Jesus. Isn't that right? <clears throat> Now watch this. Then he says in verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. So what does that mean? We just analyze. If you know me, you know my father. I think the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Right? It's kind of that, that whole idea. Yeah. Right? I'm actually thinking of doing a training at one point called like father like son. You know? Which is which I think would be cool because it just illustrates the unity that I'm about to show you here. So watch this, okay? Think about this, okay? If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. This is what he says. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. Like, is this guy slow? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, the mess alive is need to scout, you know? He just didn't come out too sharp. And, you know, he's one of those dull tools. Like, seriously. He just said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says, well, you know, just show us show the Father. Us the Father. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the disciples are very entertaining. Yeah. I can see why Jesus stuck around for a while. <laughs> you know, that's why I don't identify with them. Yes. Because uh, Jesus lives in me and he, they didn't have him living in them. True. See, Jesus is my example, not Peter or any of those guys. So, if you come with a story that says, well, you know, even Paul couldn't get old Timothy healed. I'm like, yeah, Jesus got them all healed. So, he's my example, not Paul. I'm not a Paulian, I'm a Christian. Exactly. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. Come on, man. I, listen, Paul's an awesome dude. I'm not against the guy. All I'm telling you is, let's not make excuses. Jesus, he's our example. Yeah, we aim. For him. Okay. I said this last night. I said this to 40 pastors. I said, if I prayed for 15 people and only 10 people got healed, do you think I should quit because I didn't get five healed? Would you quit if five people didn't get healed and 10 people got healed? 10 good reasons to carry on. 10 good reasons to carry on, right? Okay. If, if one of those five people died... Would it then be worthwhile giving up? No, because he got healed in. Now watch this. Now let's say, let's say, right? You hit one, you missed one. You hit one, you missed one. You hit one, you missed one. Let's say that happened. All right? And the last one you got, someone died on you. Should you still give up? No. Because even a lifeguard doesn't give up after someone drowns on them. Exactly. Yeah. Even a surgeon doesn't quit doing that operation just because he failed last time. Because this time he might actually save someone's life. You see, the day you quit is the day you cut off the opportunity for God to do something amazing through you. But you know what? It's almost like we have this, I don't know, weird righteous anger thing that happens. Well, you said you are going to use me and you didn't. So I tried this thing. It doesn't work. <laughs> Who do you think you are, man? You're dead. You don't get to talk to God like that. It's not your life. It's not even your body. It's His. You don't get to decide what you do with that flesh. He does. Or didn't you buy into this thing? Listen, every day I have to remind myself of this stuff. Because if I don't, man, it's so easy to give up. Man, it's easy. You know, it's easy to go out of the way of the world. It's easy. Guess what? That way is destruction. You're dead already. Does it make sense what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Look, 
Does a king own his kingdom? Does a king own his kingdom? Okay. When he died on that cross, do you think he bought you? The Bible says he redeemed us. That means he paid the highest price for you. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, true. Okay, so guess what? All of mankind right now, did God pay for all of them? Did Jesus pay for every single human being? Yes. yes. Okay, and that is exactly why Jesus will hold those accountable who lived for themselves and didn't surrender to him. Because their lives belong to him. He bought them. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Because he, he owns us. Now you can think that's a bad thing. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. People tell me, you know, Mark, life's unfair. I say, yes, it is. Jesus died for me. I get forgiven. That's pretty unfair. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Who, who doesn't want to be God's son? You're going to be strangely demented not to be God's son. Like, seriously. I mean... You get to be the son of God. Yeah. You know, have you ever seen these games, like, you know, games that people play? Have you, has anyone ever seen Skyrim? With, yeah. uh, with Oblivion and all that. Mm. They've got this new thing where, you know, the, they call themselves Dragonborn. Have you heard of that? Okay. Well, that means that, you know, they've got the blood of a dragon in them or something. Right? Well, guess what? I'm Godborn. Mm. Now, that offends you. You just don't know who you are. Yeah. Because you're God born. Yeah. We're born from above. Amen. Amen. We're born from God. Mm. By His choosing. By His will. Mm. Let me tell you something. It's way cooler than being dragon born. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Because yes. I get to say, go to the devil. Heaven backs me up. And hell has to obey. You can do the same. What if we've been tormented by things that were meant to submit to us? Yeah. What if we've allowed things to dominate us that we were meant to be dominating? Yes. Amen. Amen. If mammon gets to tell you what you can and cannot do, then who's choosing what you do? You or mammon? Yes. Amen. Now let me tell you this. If God says go and Mammon says no, who do you listen to? So then why do most people say, well, we don't have money to go and preach the gospel? Didn't, Jesus didn't say, give me your money. He said, give me your life. Mm. You know, the robbers say, give me your money all your life. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want your money, he wants your life. Because he knows if he has your life, then everything will be awesome. What is what is the matter? Okay, look. I want you to just take God's perspective on this for a second. Can we do that? Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. Okay. If if this is a stretch for you, forgive me. Okay? I'm just a weird Durbanite and maybe I don't know stuff. It's okay. I love you guys, okay? I'm not here to make anyone li anyone's life miserable. I'm here to help you walk in your identity as a son. But in order to do that, I need to get you to think differently about who you are. Okay? I need you to start thinking like God. Yeah. Oh, that's for me. How can you say that? How can you even say remotely that we must think like God? Well, how many of you know that 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it's 2, says that you have the mind of Christ? Yeah, amen, amen. How, how many of you believe that? Yeah. Do you have the mind of Christ? Yes, oh. yes. Okay, are you going to get it or do you have it? Yeah. Amen. Okay, so then hold on, if you have it, then how come you kind of don't always use it? <laughs> yeah, do you know that there's two types of wisdom in this world? Yeah. Okay, there's the wisdom of the world, right? And then there's the wisdom of God. Yeah. Right? Okay, what does the wisdom of the world say? Let me give you some examples. Now, buddy, don't count all your chickens before they hatch. You know what? Well, God calls those things that are not as if they are. So you think he's in the business of counting them chickens, don't you think? Mm. <laughs> Isn't that contrary to human wisdom? Human wisdom says, you know, you want to save some money for a rainy day, China. <laughs> Isn't that right? 
Hell yeah, you know what God says? No worry, there'll always be money, no matter what the rainy day. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Why? Because money serves God. God doesn't serve money. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. okay. How many of you have ever read Isaiah 55? Okay, let me remind you what it says. I pronounce it like that. Sorry. I, I can't help myself. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. It's a guy who prophesied about Jesus in, you know, 54 verse 3, something like that. Right, you guys with me? Mm -hmm. You all know what I'm talking about, right? In Isaiah 55, okay, you get verse 11, it reads like this. So will it be, the words that come out from my mouth, they will not return to me empty, but they will accomplish the task for which I sent them. Amen. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. So, is that true for God? That is, yes. is it always true for God? Yes. Is Jesus God? Yes. Okay. Is Jesus God? Yes. Is Jesus always God? Yes. Is it true for Jesus? Yes. Okay. Then why when He lives in you does it suddenly become untrue? He lives here and suddenly what you say doesn't matter. Maybe it matters what you say. Maybe your words will not be empty, but they will actually accomplish the task for which they are sent. Amen. Maybe they will not return void unto you. Richard. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Now, when we see bad news and we agree with it, we're more convinced it's true because we've seen it, and then we reinforce it. And you speak in absolute faith in death over your life. Exactly. But maybe we need to change the eyes with which we see. Mm -hmm. Now close these ones. Open these ones. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Let the eyes of your heart be enlightened. Yes. Amen. Amen. This is my prayer for you tonight. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened that you may see who you are Amen. in Christ. Yes. Amen. Because Jesus didn't see problems. He saw opportunities for glory. Yes. And you've got to understand this. It's amazing. God does, listen, do you think there's a problem God can't solve? I mean, imagine like God's walking on the earth. You know, something happens and he goes, oh, never thought that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Some people act like that. They sin and they go, God, you know, I know there was something you never thought I would do. And he's like, nah, I knew that was coming for a couple of years, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know how people keep reminding God of their sin? You know? He's saying, God, you know, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I'm sorry, I did this, and I'm sorry. And he's like going, yeah, yeah, I was there. I knew you did that. I kind of remember all this stuff. <laughs> okay, um, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, stop. Yeah, stop, stop. You're forgiven. You know the only reason you confess your sins is for your benefit, not for his? Yeah. The Bible says, if you confess your sins... God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That scripture is not saying you only get forgiven when you confess. It's saying that when you confess, you can be sure that even your conscience will be clean from the memory of sin. You see, God's posture towards you is forgiven. Serious. That's why his door is always open. Because he's already counted the whole world dead to him. And only those who put their trust in Jesus alive to Him. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah, man. This is yeah. how it works, guys. So, so like, when you sin, God's not going, Puffy! I can't believe you! Oh my goodness, what did you do? He's not saying that. He's like, don't worry, it'll be okay. Come back to me, we'll sort this thing out. I'll give you what you need to win. You're all parents, right? I saw many of you parents. Okay, I've said this before. When a child takes their first step, right? Do they do it perfectly? No. How many of you have ever seen a perfect step? It always ends in a fall. Yeah. All right? You might take the perfect step and fall. You think your father's going to go, I can't believe you fell down. Or do you think like you, he'd be like, Well done, son, you took a step. Get back up and do it again. Mm. Yep. See, is your God your father or is he just your God? Because 
if he's just your God, you're actually still suffering from an orphan spirit. You still don't know who your daddy is. Yes. Yes. And listen, I'm not talking about sugar daddies, okay? So just whoever gets that idea, just chuck it. Chuck it. <laughs> okay? I get to call him Abba. And Abba means daddy. And if you don't like it, go do your research. Yes. It's a fact. And I dig the fact that I get to call him daddy. It's yeah. awesome. But you know what? I know my dad is also God. And there's a respect that comes with that. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. There's a respect that comes with that. Okay, so John 14, yeah? Jesus said to him, okay, so he asked this really interesting question, doesn't he? Right? Show us the Father and it will be enough with us, for us. And Jesus said to him, this is in verse um, 9, just so you know. And he says, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Now hold on, let's just get a picture here, right? Jesus is saying to them, look guys, from now on, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Philip's like, okay, Jesus, look, just show us the Father and, you know, we'll get it. <laughs> yeah? And then Jesus goes, Philip, how long have I been with you and you still don't know me? <laughs> Who do you think's talking? Oh, you see, Jesus was so in union with the Father, you couldn't tell them apart. Yeah. And maybe, if we read on, we'll find that we're supposed to be abiding in Him. Mm -hmm. And check what He says. He says this, Whoever has seen Me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in Me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will they do, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. How many of you love Jesus? Amen. We've got five. Okay. Everyone else, you're not supposed to be here. Or you're going to get saved. <laughs> How many of you want to receive Jesus for the first time? Anyway, no one? Okay, so do you love Jesus? Yes. You should see more hands. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Amen. Okay, good. Now we've got a consensus. All right. So if you love Jesus... Okay, what does he mean by keeping his commandments? You know, we don't live by the law, right? No. So he says here, right, what does he say? If you keep my commandments, does he say if you keep the law? What does he say if you keep my commandments? What do you think Jesus' commandments were? Go to John 13. Should be like on the same area in your Bible. Okay? This is all contextual. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and hold your place in John 14 because we're going to get back there. But I want to show you what the commandment is. Verse 34. Okay? A new commandment I give to you. What does it say? A new commandment. Oh, yeah. That means that the old one is old. Yeah. The new one is new. Yeah? Yep. It's cool, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. Wow. Is this his commandment? Yep. So when Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, forever even the spirit of truth whom you cannot receive because, the, who the world, sorry, cannot receive because you neither see him nor know him. You know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Amen. Amen. Now you have him in you. In you. They didn't have him in them. in them. They had him with them. 
Mm-hmm. Why? Because Jesus was with them. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. Then he says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. So what's the opposite of an orphan? A son, right? Okay. We're going to be dealing with orphans and sons a lot. It says that God has made in Christ a new man. Is he talking about man as in Adam and males? Or is he talking about man as in mankind? Right? But you'll find someone say, well, he made a new man, but the woman he left behind. (laughs) I'll be like, what are you talking about? So it's important that we realize it's not a gender thing. Amen? Okay? It's a relationship thing. Amen? He's no respecter of men. Now, what about women? (laughs) See what I'm saying? He means everyone. No respecter of anybody in mankind. Girls and guys, listen to me very carefully. You are equal in God's eyes. Okay? Your value is the same. He He paid the same Jesus for each one of you. He doesn't devalue you, see you as less than anything else. Okay? And let me just add this. Since when does what you do determine your value? You see, in this world we live in, unless you're a procurator you, or a doctor, you like nothing. Right? You're on the bottom of the food chain or you're somewhere in between. Okay? And people value themselves by their career choices. Well, you know, my son, I want you to be a doctor. Because why? So that you can be respected in your community. Because that's the kind of people who get respected. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. Some people look at me like, but that's not true. That doesn't happen. Like, what world do you live in? <laughs> <clears throat> that's what happens, isn't it? Your career choices end up determining your value. Your value has got nothing to do with your career choice. You could sweep the streets for the rest of your life. And let me tell you something. You'd still be as valuable to God as His own son. It doesn't matter what you're doing with your life. Except there's one thing. Your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Him. Now, we're not, I've learned, the most exciting life is one surrendered to Him. Really? How many of you have ever laid hands on the sick? Okay. When they got healed, how excited was that? Awesome. Right. Now, those of you who haven't, you're missing out. <clears throat> because the moment you do that, your life changes. You realize you can make a difference in a bigger way than you ever thought you could. Yeah. You know what happens? You start seeing sick people. <laughs> <laughs> people know, right? People, people who know, know. Yeah. They are. You start seeing sick people everywhere. You go to the mall and they are there. <laughs> Go to Goldie City and they are there. <laughs> Man, where you go? And before it was like, what sick people? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? Like, I mean, I remember when I, when I first like woke up to it, I was like, they are everywhere. <laughs> like, I'm driving and then like, I, if I had to stop every sick person, I would not get to work. I would like literally be like, how many of you felt like that sometimes? Yeah. You're like, the devil puts them on the road just so they can <laughs> punch you, yeah. you know? Yeah. And one day I'm just going to pull over and just heal them all <laughs> and make him sorry he did that. And then, does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's the way it is. When you wake up to the reality that God has deposited in you the ability to help people this way, man, you want to do it. But you see, the minute it becomes something that qualifies you as a son, the minute it becomes something that determines whether your father accepts you or not, then it's no longer about the fun of doing it. Then it's about trying to earn from from father what he's already given. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. If we need to give another prophetic word just so that we can feel saved, then it's not about the fact that we know that we are loved yeah. by Him and that we are made to be loved because He lives in us and through us. 
but then it becomes about we are having an, a, a full on identity meltdown. And we, we're forgetting who we are because we're forgetting who loves us. Does this make any sense? Yeah. Okay, really, really important. Super, super important that we understand this. So if you love me, you also keep my commandments. And then he'll give us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not leave us. Or he'll not leave us orphans because we have the Holy Spirit. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and that my Father is in me. And that I am in you. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got I am inside my Father. Yeah? Right? Right? So when you see the Father, you see Jesus. Right? When you see Jesus, you see the Father. And then what? I am in you. Right? So later on in John. Jesus makes this prayer and he says, Father, even as you've sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. And then in John 20, Jesus comes back after his resurrection and he says this. He says, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. So he gives a confirmation to the prayer he prayed. Yeah. The yeah. Father has answered that prayer yeah. and that he's sending them. Right <laughs> Now, if, he's, if Jesus was sent in this manner, the works that I do... It's not I who do them, but it is the Father in me who does them through me. Isn't this how Jesus did it? Yeah. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. So I who do them, is not, is not, these are not my words. These are his words. Yes. These are not my works. These are his works. Why? Because Jesus rested from his works. Yes. You rest from your works to do his works. Yes. And you do his works not because you deserve to, but because he paid for you to be able to. Yes. Isn't that right? Yeah. So and most people are trying to find up the mountain and achieve Christian status. Yeah. Right? But by through Jesus, you are on the mountain and you get to keep Christian status. Does it make sense? sense? Yeah. It's a difference between keeping, um, keeping the territory that's been won and trying to take territory that's never been won before. Yes. And we don't live... Towards victory, we live from victory. Yes. Because Jesus has already overcome the world. We're not trying to overcome the world. We are stepping into the victory of Christ and enforcing the victory of Christ. Yeah. Is this all making sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we are enforcers of God's victory. We are not trying to achieve a victory. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So watch what he says, Jan. We are inside one another. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Yep. Now hold on. Many people want to see Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus just gave you the formula. Okay? You know what the number one thing is that people miss out on? Hey? Eh? Is they miss out on this one thing that God is love and they mean to be love. Okay, and now, now I can take you through these, and I don't want to do that because I think it's probably running out of time. Yeah, running out of time. But but just the thing I want to I want to leave with you, and we're gonna carry on further on this as we go as we go along. A vine, the true vine is Jesus. A vine is the sum total of all its branches. Yeah. Okay, a vine is the sum total of all its branches. So what does Jesus say? I am the true vine. Wow. That means I am the sum total of all my branches. Mm. Yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he says, and you are my branch. Mm. Isn't that right? Yes. yes. Okay? Does it make sense? Yeah. So any branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes. Any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes out. Yeah. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Look, and I'm just reading what it says. Okay, not I'm not trying to add anything to what it, I'm just trying to show you what it says. The larger context of this is to understand that a vine, okay, the branch is in the vine, and the vine is in the branch. Where does the branch end and the vine start, and where does the vine end and the branch start? Mm. Ah, you're getting this picture. Good. Hallelujah. Okay. So what does it mean? 
That means if we are the branches in the vine, and He is the vine, then we are part of the vine. Okay, now why would Jesus say I'm the true vine? Because Jesus said, we do not expect um, to find good fruit from a bad tree. Yeah. And we don't expect to find good fruit on a bad tree. Yeah? Yeah. Now immediately people think talking about fruit. Not talking about fruit. It's talking about trees. trees yeah. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> it says, well if you want good fruit, you must change the tree. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> you must make the tree good. Mm. Right? Well, um, so then later on, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Think he's building on this analogy? Yes, 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 yes. So, so what is he saying? You thought you were a tree, but actually you're a branch. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome, yeah. There's only ever been two trees. The first tree was Adam, and he was a bad tree. And the second tree is Jesus, and he is the true vine. Yeah. Divine. It's not the true Bible. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So now when you look at Adam, what comes out of Adam? We're going to talk about some of the things that come out of Adam. Okay? And I want to just headline it with this. Adam is the master orphan. Yeah. Adam is the master orphan. Okay? Because Adam acts like... And his descendants act like, okay, they are always in lack. Yep. Have you guys ever watched Oliver Twist? You're not the lemon twist, the Oliver Twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you watched it? Mm -hmm. Oliver Twist, he eats a bowl of soup, and what does he do? Can I have some more? Can I have some more, please, sir? <laughs> See, I did that in school. It's funny. <laughs> right? Can I have some more, please, sir? And then what happened? Got beat up. Right? Now, orphans, okay, are always begging because they don't have a dad that looks after them. Orphans are always begging because they don't have a dad that looks after them. Sons do not beg because they know what's in their father's house. If your prayer life consists of begging God, you might want to check whether you're operating in an orphan spirit. That's true. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm trying to help you. Yeah. Because it's just a decision you make. You, you flip the switch. You yeah. change. Okay? It's that simple. Mm. God's not hung up on it. He's just hoping one day you'll hear it and change. It's all. Mm. And why? Because He wants you to realize what you have so that you can start living in it. Yeah. Imagine if I paid for you to have the most amazing holiday <clears throat> and you didn't go on it because you believed you couldn't afford it. Imagine, <clears throat> how many of you eat breakfast? <laughs> Some people don't eat breakfast. That's why I have to ask this question. See, these people don't eat breakfast. I'll pray for you, brother. <laughs> eat breakfast. <laughs> right, so if you eat breakfast, have you ever noticed how they'll prepare the table and make breakfast ready, right? And then they'll say, breakfast is on the table, right? There's a call. Yeah, yeah. Breakfast is on the table. <clears throat> Did you notice that breakfast doesn't magically show up in your stomach? <laughs> Isn't it? You actually have to head off to the table. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. What makes you go to the table? The Word. Because <laughs> yeah. you might have been hungry, but without the Word to make the promise that there's something on the table, you had nothing to respond to. That's true. You couldn't mix your faith unless you heard the promise. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. Faith <clears throat> is the response on the promise that you accept the promise as a title deed that what you cannot see is already yours. Yeah, amen. And we've got that recorded. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> I need to go listen to that later. So, does this make sense? Yeah. You have to understand. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning. Come on, people. We're all learning. 
Now I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to keep diminishing myself yeah. so that you will stop putting people on pedestals. Mm -hmm. Because the Holy Ghost is in you. Mm -hmm. You can do this. Amen. Every one of you can do this. Amen. You don't understand my background. I don't care about your background. If my, according to me, guess what? You're born from heaven. You've got a background that goes back to your Father in heaven. Exactly. Amen. 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 Listen, okay. Uh, wait, wait, what is what is baptism? What is baptism in water? It's death, right? Right. Okay, so how many of you believe you've died? The old man is dead. Yes. Amen. Come on. Yes. Amen. All right. So if you believe that you've died and the old man is dead, and by the way, that's in Romans 6. If you don't believe me, go read the whole of chapter 6. No, we can read it now if you want, but it's going to take very long. So go read it. The whole of chapter 6. It says very clearly that we believe, and Paul's writing, we believe that we were crucified with him on that cross. We were buried with him and we were raised with him in a new way of life. Amen. So you die with Christ by faith. Yes. It's not a maybe. Amen. The best exegesis on the gospel we have. Is the, is the book of Romans. Yep. And by the way, I recommend you read the book of Romans at least a hundred times. Yes, amen. Every day. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a recommendation. I didn't say you had to do it. <laughs> Before you think I'm legalistic. <laughs> sure. It's... So, I love the book of Romans because it's so clear. Yeah. It's so clear. And it's a very difficult... To, uh, if you want to, obviously you can get confused because people choose to. Like Peter says, some people twist things for their own destruction, right? Mm -hmm. Just like they do the other scriptures, right? He says that. But what Paul reveals in the book of Romans is really, really powerful for you as a, as a, as a son of God to walk in. And we will go through some of that stuff as we go through this journey. But, but here's the deal. I want you to get a hold of this. That you have a choice every day. Do I live... <clears throat> In God, alive to God, because of what's happened with me in Christ. In other words, do I live in the vine or do I live in Adam? Mm. Okay? Now, Adam represents your papa and your mama and everyone up the line. <laughs> okay? Now, have you seen a vineyard? Okay? There's like this genealogy website online, right? It uses a vine. Okay, why? Because if you really draw a genealogy tree properly, it looks like a vine. Yeah. yeah it does. Yes. Okay? Right. And Jesus says there's this tree called Adam, right? Because he's the true tree, it's called Jesus. Mm -hmm. So there's these true vines. Your genealogy. Yep. Does it make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So there's mankind 1.0 and there's mankind 2.0. Or should I say the last mankind? Yeah. yeah. Okay? I'm not saying there's another version. I'm just saying it's the next version to one. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So when, when we look at it, we'll see, okay, there's sin and death here. There's a law of spirit of life here. There's sin coming into the world and bringing sickness and disease. There's righteousness coming into the world and bringing life and peace. Does this make yeah. sense? Yeah. 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 You'll see this dynamic, and we're going to go through some of this. I'll show you some of these things as we go through. But this is the dynamic you're going to see, and what you're going to end up with is a reality that says this. If I abide in Him, I will be like Him. And this is the evidence that I abide in Him. That even as He walked, so I walk. Amen? And that means everything I do is love. Everything I do is love. When I lay hands on the sick, I'm doing it out of love. Yeah. When I cast out demons, I'm doing it out of love. When I preach the gospel, I'm doing it out of love. I'm a minister of reconciliation, not a minister of condemnation. Amen. Does this make sense? Yes. Amen. Okay? And this is ultimately what you're going to realize about your identity. How many of you are excited about that? Mm. Amen. 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 We've got two people excited. Yes. Happy to see you guys tomorrow morning. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. Look, I just want to precursor this, okay? Me personally, okay, I can tell you this now, okay? Even though God has made an open invitation to every single person in the world to receive the good news and to be born again, I have concluded that Christianity is not for everyone. 
It's not for sissies. It's not for pansies. It's not for people who don't want to take Jesus seriously. And so if you want to play church, go play church somewhere else. Yeah, amen. Okay? But if you want to grow up and be like Jesus amen. and change this world, even if everyone's against you, but you're going to be obedient to God and you're in the right place, I commend you. We'll stand with you. We'll work with you. We'll be there for you like brothers and sisters on this journey. Amen? Amen. Okay, but we don't, we, we listen. Time for games is over. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We play too much. Yes. Okay? The Jesus? Why? Because they're going to mistake you for Jesus. Because you're going to act so much like him that they won't know where you end and where he starts. Yes. Because Amen. you'll say, how long have I been with you? And you still don't know me? Yeah. Yo. Okay? Is that cool? Yeah. Hallelujah. Can I pray for you? Is yes. that okay? Yes. Yes. All right. Close your eyes, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for your spirit, for your life, for your power, for your wisdom. Father, but above all, I thank you for your love. Yeah. That not only have you shown us your love, not only have you demonstrated your love, but you have chosen to allow us to be your love. Yeah. Father, I thank you that in our hearts, even as we go into the rest of tonight, that we surrender completely <coughs> our hearts to you to do whatever change you need to do. To make us ready to receive all that you've already given us. Because we know, Father... That you're not holding out on us. That you're not the one who is trying to hold back on us. Yeah. But that the enemy has lied to us and has deceived us into thinking that we lack what you've already given us. Yes. So we thank you for the revealing of what we have. Yeah. And that we will not only see it and understand it, but that we will actually choose to walk in it. Yeah. Not for our own glory, because we know we've already been given your glory. Yeah. But because we want to bring glory to you. Mm. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Amen.